Hundreds of inmates barefoot and stripped down to white shorts scurry into El Salvador's new mega prison, ordered to crouch down on the ground one after another. Imagine being locked up in a prison with 40,000 other inmates, the majority belonging to the country's most violent gangs. In this bleak environment, privacy, dignity, and hope are luxuries you can only dream of. Welcome to El Salvador's new mega prison, the largest and most controversial jail in the Americas. A nightmare of gangs and violence. February 24th, 2023. Hundreds of detainees were transferred to El Salvador's new mega prison by order of President Nayib Bukele. At that point, the prison was officially named the Terrorism Confinement Center, and it was meant to be the ultimate solution to the crime problem in El Salvador. President Bukele proudly posted a video on Twitter showing the massive operation with dramatic music and flashy editing. He zoomed in on the inmates' tattoos, revealing their affiliation to the notorious gangs that have terrorized the country for decades. He also showed aerial shots of the prison, highlighting its size and security. This was his way of showing the world that he was serious about his iron-fisted policy of cracking down on crime and restoring order in the country. He also wanted to send a message to the gangs and the people. He was in charge, and he wouldn't tolerate any challenge to his authority. I think that the pandillas, as we know them now, will exist in three or four years. But how did El Salvador end up with the largest prison in the Americas and one of the highest incarceration rates in the world? You see, the thing is, mass incarceration is nothing new in El Salvador. The country's prison system has always been overcrowded, violent, and brutal. Nearly 2% of the adult population is behind bars, and many of them live in inhumane conditions. In La Esperanza, the country's largest prison until last year, over 30,000 inmates were squeezed into cells meant for just over 10,000. That made life on the inside a constant fight for survival, with scarce resources, rampant diseases, and frequent riots. But things got even worse when a wave of bloodshed swept the country. March 26, 2023. El Salvador saw the most violent day since the end of the Civil War in 1992. 62 people were killed in cold blood in different parts of the country. By the end of the week, the death toll had reached 87, shocking the nation and the world. The authorities blamed the MS-13 and Barrio 18, also known as the 18th Street Gang, the two most powerful and dangerous gangs in El Salvador for these murders. These gangs have been waging war for territory, money, and power for years and they have no regard for human life. They recruit young and vulnerable people, especially from poor and marginalized communities, forcing them to join their ranks. And so, in response to this violence, President Bukele declared a state of emergency, which gave him the power to suspend some laws and constitutional rights in the name of public safety. He launched a massive crackdown on these gangs, arresting over 75,000 people in a matter of months. He used the police and the army to set up checkpoints, raid houses, and search the streets. And from above, he used drones to spy on the people, looking for any sign of gang activity. He didn't care if there were no arrest warrants, lawyers for those detained, or even trials. He just wanted them off the streets and behind bars. Now, when it first happened, numerous human organizations accused the police of making arrests just to meet quotas, without bothering to investigate the individuals they were detaining. They would grab people from their everyday routines, whether they were out on the street, at work, or even at home. Sometimes just having a tattoo was all it took to raise their suspicions, since tats had long been associated as a mark of gang affiliation. Bukele would also introduce new measures to make it easier to arrest and detain suspected gang members. He would extend the provisional detention period, meaning people can be held in custody indefinitely before being convicted. Now, what's more, he lowered the age of criminal responsibility, meaning that children as young as 12 can be tried for their alleged gang involvement. Human rights organizations claim that around 1,600 children have been arrested under this this law. Now, you might think that the prison is the end of the line for these gang members, that once they're locked up, they can't do any more harm, but you couldn't be more wrong. Because the truth is, prison is just another battlefield for them, a place where they can continue their bloody war 
even from behind bars. In fact, many of the killings that happened last year and started this whole thing were ordered by inmates, bribing the guards and smuggling in phones. And that's exactly why President Bukele decided to build the Terrorism Confinement Center, which he claimed would put an end to the violence and to the gang culture once and for all. This prison is a modern fortress built in the middle of nowhere. It's designed to prevent any escape, any contact, or any communication between gang members and the outside world. It's a place where inmates must serve their time without any chance of escape or special treatment. And now let's check out the latest videos that have emerged from inside the world's most infamous prison. Inside the Mega Prison Inside this mega prison, you'll find some of El Salvador's most dangerous gang members packed into massive cells, towers of bunk beds, and what looks like bird cages. Mr. Bukele over here is proud of his mega prison. Even though many human rights groups have condemned it, he thinks the only way to fight crime in El Salvador is to build more of these. And he has some numbers to back him up. Since the state of emergency was announced, the homicide rate in the country has decreased by almost 70%. But he doesn't want to tell his people just about his success. He wants to show them. That's why he took a camera crew with him and went inside this prison for a rare glimpse of what life is like behind the bars of this new colossal facility. The Fortress as he walks through the main gate, President Bukele is greeted by the governor of the prison, who proudly shows him around the collection area. Now this is where all the inmates are processed and stripped of any belongings. Unlike old prisons where gangs had access to anything from music to women, over here they have just their uniforms and their cells. The governor tells the president that the prison is also designed to prevent any contact between the inmates and the gangs. The phones and radios are jammed, and the mail and visitors are screened. The inmates have no way of knowing what's happening outside, or of sending any messages or orders. The president nods in approval as he listens to the governor. He knows how much this prison means for his nation. For too long, the gangs have terrorized the people and corrupted the system. They've turned the prisons into their own fortresses, where they could plot, recruit, and smuggle with impunity. But not anymore. They made sure that this prison was different. How? By putting it in the middle of nowhere, far away from any civilization. It's surrounded by vast fields and mountains, with no roads or buildings in sight. This place is completely self-sufficient, with its own water and power supply. So in short, it's isolated from El Salvador and from the rest of the world. And so the president believes that by cutting gang members off from their leaders and allies. He hopes to weaken their influence and power, and by locking them up in this hell, he hopes to deter anyone from joining them or following them. The Guards of Hell According to the governor, they are the protectors who are supposed to make the people of El Salvador feel safe. But just imagine being a guard in the most dangerous prison in the country, a place where every single inmate is a ruthless gang member, marked by ink and violence. A prison where you have to be ready for anything, at any time. That's the reality for the guards in this mega prison. You can see in the video here how they prepare for their daily duty. They have full riot gear on, like soldiers in a war zone. We have helmets, guns, and a lot of other weapons trying to protect them from any attack. They know that these gangs are unpredictable and aggressive, and they have to be on guard at all times. And so they have trained to deal with any situation, and many of them have a military background. The prison is brand new, and so is the equipment. The government has spared no expense to make this the most secure and modern prison in the country. They want to show the gangs that they have no power here, and that they are under complete control. And right now we're going to show you a rare glimpse into the world of these prison guards, and how they train to deal with with one of the most dangerous scenarios imaginable, a prison riot. For them, this isn't just a drill, but a matter of life and death. So now here you can see them in action, as they simulate a riot situation in the prison. Armed with guns and riot gear, they storm into the prison ready to face any threat. They split into teams, each assigned to a different cell block. They know that each cell can hold at least a hundred inmates, many of them violent gang members. They don't know if these inmates have weapons, but they're not taking any chances. They have their helmets, bulletproof vests, and machine guns. Their mission is to stop the riot before it spreads. They know that these cells are locked, so they hope to contain the chaos within each cell. But they also know that anything can happen, and that they would have to act fast if it did. But are they alone here? No. They have backup ready at all times. On the upper levels of the prison, there are more guards, also armed with their guns. 
They have a bird's eye view of this whole thing, and they can shoot if they have to. And this, my friends, is how they keep the prison under control. So now we saw their security measures, and how these guards keep these people in line. How about we take a look at where those hardened criminals will be kept, and the conditions they'll be facing. Inmate Quarters when it comes to the cells, this facility is designed for mass incarceration, with quadruple tier bunks to hold a large number of prisoners. Now in here we can see a hundred metal bunks crammed together, leaving a little space for movement. The only wash facilities are two baths at the front, which the guards can turn on and off at their will. They also only have two toilets in here, adding to the dismal and unsanitary atmosphere. Now these spaces are designed to use natural light as much as possible, with two large windows on each side. The artificial lighting is minimal, and the facilities are pretty basic. Plus, the prisoners are expected to spend most of their time in their cells, under the watchful eye of the guards. Now, what if you break the rules or pose a threat? Well, then you're sent to solitary confinement, a place straight out of your nightmare. The wing's a concrete block with no power, no light, and no comfort. Just a concrete floor and a hole in the ground. In this wing, you have no access to anything that could distract you from your misery. No books, no music, no phone calls, no visitors. You are alone, my friend, with your thoughts and the occasional glimpse of a guard through the small slit in the door. The prison is also equipped with high-tech security systems. We have CCTV and surveillance devices everywhere, monitoring the prisoners to prevent any trouble. Not only that, but the guards also have full control of this solitary confinement wing, where they can observe, feed, and handcuff the prisoners through a metal flap on the door. The guards are trained to avoid any contact or communication with the prisoners to prevent any attacks or manipulation. Now, the president's goal here is clear. One, dismantle gang culture. Two, take back control of El Salvador. In isolation, prisoners are completely cut off from each other, which is a big change from the olden times where the gangs ran the show. Prisons used to be covered with gang-affiliated graffiti, and prisoners were able to have all the contraband they wanted. Oh no sir, not here. Rehabilitation or slavery? Nah, you might be wondering. But what do these prisoners do to pass the time? Well, the prison has all kinds of facilities. We have dining halls, exercise rooms, and even ping pong tables. But they're off limits to the inmates. Those amenities are just for the guards. Instalaciones para todos los custodios, policías y soldados, no para los, no para los, no para los estos criminales que solo se merecen que llevamos. Prisoners, on the other hand, have very few reasons to leave their cells. They have two options, go to court or face that harsh punishment in those dark windowless cells in solitary confinement that you just saw. But hey, it ain't all bad. There is one other thing that these prisoners can do, work. They will not be in hotels, Mr. President, but these people have to know that they will come to work. They will come here to purge their pain and to work on the basis of all this work. Produce. Now, the prison has set up special work areas where inmates are assigned different jobs and tasks using various tools and equipment. This is supposed to help them pay back some of their debts to society. This is hardly fun nor rewarding. You could see it as a form of modern-day slavery. External Security now we've talked about what it looks like on the inside. What about the outside? Well, it's equally or even more secure. But what if someone still decides to try their luck and escape? Well, let's say they're going to face a very tough challenge. The first layer of security is this beautiful electrified chain fence that surrounds the entire prison. This wonderful barrier delivers 15,000 volts of electricity at all times. Anyone who tries to climb over it will be cooked. The second layer of security is the gravel-covered area lying between the fence and the prison walls. The gravel's there to make noise, acting as its own sound alarm. If anyone does manage to get past that fence and steps on the gravel, the guards will hear it and respond immediately. That gravel's pretty hard to walk and run on, so it does slow down any potential escapees. But let's say you're doing it, you got past these two. We have a third layer of security, with a concrete wall that encloses the prison. Now this is reinforced, standing at a towering 35 feet high. It's pretty impossible to scale, but if you do get up there, there's an electrified fence that'll stop you. That beauty up there is also delivering the same 15,000 volts of electricity. This wall also blocks any view of the outside world, isolating the prisoners from any hope of freedom. This fence is looked after by 19 towers, where guards keep an eye on everything that happens in and out of the prison. The towers are strategically placed to provide clear visibility and prevent any unauthorized movements. The fourth layer of security is the prison itself. As we already showed you, it's divided into secure modules, 
where prisoners are locked up in these cells. The spaces are small and bare, with only their basic necessities. The inmates have no access to any windows, phones, or internet. They are under constant surveillance by CCTV and guards. The prison is also locked down, meaning that no one can enter or exit without authorization. And this leads to the fifth and final layer of security, with the army patrolling, covering the whole outside area of the prison. Now, as we already mentioned, the mega prison is located in a remote and desolate place, far away from any towns or cities, which makes it really easy for the army to conduct patrols and prevent any external threats. That army, by the way, is about 600 soldiers and 250 members of the National Civil Police, all armed and on rotation. They're ready to deal with any attempts by gangs or any other group trying to break in the prison or damage its infrastructure. They are also responsible for maintaining security and order in and around the prison. After everything we've learned so far now, this place kind of sounds like the perfect solution for gang violence, right? Well, we thought so too, but hold on a sec. If over 75,000 people have been arrested, how are they all going to fit in this prison that was only meant to hold 40,000? Do we care about human rights? The Dark Side Now we've heard about this wonderful prison from the government and the president, but now it's time to hear from the other side, the inmates. Todo esto me arruinó mi vida. Gracias a esto, a lo que yo soy, fui en un momento, eh, vine a perder a mi familia. Imagine being locked up in a prison where you're treated worse than an animal, where you have to eat with your bare hands, sleep on the floor, and share a filthy bathroom with hundreds of others, where you're denied medical care, even if you have a bullet wound or a terminal illness, where you're subjected to torture, abuse, and violence every day. This is the reality for thousands of inmates in El Salvador who have been arrested since the implementation of this state of exception, which had been condemned by international human rights organizations as cruel, inhumane, and degrading. Raquel Caballero of the Attorney General's Office for Human Rights in El Salvador was shocked and appalled by what she saw when she went to the prisons, where the state of exception was enforced. She said, The fact that they're served food in their hands is inhumane. The overcrowding, all in the same cell for 24 hours, it's like the torture facilities of the past. You would think that all of that was over, a thing of the past. But once the doors are opened, what will we see? She would go on to talk about the alarming number of deaths that have occurred in the prisons since the state of exception began. She said that many of them were due to preventable causes, such as infections, diseases, or even injuries. She would share some heartbreaking stories of prisoners who were left to suffer and die in that prison. One of them had a bullet stuck in his hip, but no one cared to remove it and treat that wound. Others would have serious illnesses that needed urgent attention, but they would be ignored and abandoned. According to her, they weren't seen as human beings, but as disposable objects. This wouldn't even be the worst part. Part. The worst part was torture. The reports by Human Rights Watch and Cristo Sal Socorro Judidiso revealed the shocking details of how the prison security members abused and tormented the inmates. Some of the survivors who spoke anonymously told them how they were beaten, burned, electrocuted, and starved. One of them was a former convict who had just been released. He told them about the cell he lived in with 350 other inmates. He said they shared a single bathroom that was always clogged and filthy. He also said they had nothing to eat with, no plates, spoons, or even cups. They had to use cut plastic bottles or bags, or just their bare hands. And what about the deaths? How many of them died in the prisons and how did they die? A government source confirmed to the human rights organizations that the inmates were dying every day and that the authorities were covering it up. They simply labeled them as natural deaths and disposed of the bodies, never bothering to investigate or perform autopsies. And when the families of the deceased came to claim them, they often found them covered in bruises, cuts, and burns. So, my life is very different now in every way. They didn't just take away half of my life, they took away my dreams. After hearing all this about the prison now, how do you think the people of El Salvador view it? La Mano Dura well, surprisingly, it turns out that a lot of people agree with this over there. In fact, they're cheering for their president, Nayib Bukele, who launched a ruthless campaign against the gangs since he took office, known as the Mano Dura, or Iron Fist Policy. They say this is the only way 
to end the bloodshed and terror that these gangs have inflicted on their society. And they have a point. Since Bukele came into power in 2019, the homicide rate in El Salvador has dropped dramatically from 51 per 100,000 people in 2018 to 2.4 per 100,000 in 2023. Now, you might be wondering how El Salvador became one of the most violent countries in the world in the first place. Well, the answer lies in its tragic history. El Salvador suffered a brutal civil war from 1980 to 1992, leaving more than 75,000 people dead and hundreds of thousands displaced. Many of them fled to the U.S., where they faced discrimination and poverty. Some of them would join gangs, like the notorious MS-13 and 18th Street, which originated in Los Angeles. When the U.S. deported them back to El Salvador, they would bring back with them their gang culture and also find fertile ground for recruitment amongst war orphans and scarred veterans. And soon they would take control over the country, carving out territories and imposing their own laws. Unlike the gangs in Mexico in Colombia, which make most of their money from the drug trade, the Salvadoran gangs rely on extortion as their main source of income. They target everyone, from young to old, struggling families, even pregnant women. No one's safe from their threats and violence. So it is no surprise that the people of El Salvador have had enough of living in fear and paying the gangs for protection and are desperate for a solution. But the question remains, is Bukele's crackdown on these gangs the solution to this problem, or is it creating a new one? Well, only time will tell.